got incredibly altitude sick. He had sandwiched twice before, but very altitude sick and was throwing photos of his family off the mountain um, saying he was going to die. And it required... And he didn't. Re- he didn't want the oxygen we gave him. Um, he refused it because he wanted to, you know, die in peace. So my next guest is an endurance athlete and author. He was the youngest Brit to complete the seven summits and last year got back from an epic cycle ride and i am delighted to introduce to the show geordie stewart geordie hey john nice to see you virtually see you but very nice yeah good to see you too um so how did you get into all these epic adventures how did i get into it um in terms of big adventures i think the most obvious starting point was a book i read when i was 17 my dad gave me Bear Grylls' book about climbing Everest. I think I was revising for my A-levels at the time. Gave me this and for some reason, something about the story or about his journey or about Everest um, just struck a chord in a way. So I think from that moment, I obsessed over Everest certainly, but then the seven summits, so the highest mountain on every continent, sort of fell out from that as I sort of delved into Wikipedia. And it sort of ticked a lot of boxes about what I wanted in terms of adventure and travel and meeting people and proving something, a bit of self-esteem and a lot of those boxes. And I sort of then set about that particular journey um, because of the book. I guess historically, if you go back to, you know, when I was younger, I've always been outdoorsy. I've always been adventurous, you know, running around in fields and having too much energy, climbing trees. I was that sort of person when I was younger. And I think that sort of adventurous spirit has probably always been there in a way. Uh, It just maybe needed an avenue to express itself. And I think certainly when you're younger, uh, it can be a bit harder to do these big expeditions, but you get to a certain age and you're a bit more free to do so. University, you had this big idea to do the seven summits. No, the university university oh, god wow yeah so i i sort of again unconventionally most people who do these big expeditions they weren't as young as i was then and again looking back now i can acknowledge that it was a more abnormal thing to do than i probably appreciated at the time i, I basically this is 18 i had a sort of gap year plan you know to do the normal uh normal trips to thailand or australia or whatever and then i basically just became obsessed by trying to do these seven summits and i basically then cancelled all my plans and just worked seven days a week putting up marquees you know working at weddings working in cool centers you know working as an indoor um carpenter or what it was else was i doing gardening things like that i like anything and everything every day of the week and i just sacrificed um, six months certainly to pay for the first expedition to Aconcagua on my gap year, which again was a huge step. It was the first uh, first big expedition, highest mountain outside the Himalayas. I lied on my application form to get a place on the trip, you know, because I had no outdoor experience really, and I sort of was claiming I'd done these great peaks in the Alps, and I knew nothing basically really. And I used some of my old dad's my dad's old sailing kit and you know, sort of improvised my way through on actually what was quite a significant expedition. Um, You know, thankfully that went well. And then I, again, went back to work. Um, I had very little money. And then I went to Kilimanjaro on a sort of shoestring budget, like a thousand pounds to go do Kili. And, um, you know, that ended up, I mean, successfully on my 19th birthday summiting, but I ran out of money and was, you know, wild camping, if you can call it that, on the streets of Nairobi. And then I eventually went to Elbrus um, before university and then and then university a year and then Denali, then tried to do Everest, failed, and then um, did the other three. So I all of the seven summits was pre and during university and then the army came after. Wild camping in Nairobi. That's, uh, I mean, I've been to Nairobi. It's chaotic. <laughs> Yeah, I know you have. Um, it's 
that that whole that whole trip was madness really um and it was one of those things which i didn't really think about until until a i wrote the book and my sister read it and was like that's mental um but i was well i was just turned 19 but i had uh, the long story was i I had a short amount small amount of money for the expedition paid for it um went up the mountain with a local guide um because i wasn't allowed to do it by myself came back and then tried to get money out of catherine machine and had nothing so i didn't have any money i only had my return bus ticket um to get to the airport on my return flights home so i didn't have anywhere to stay and didn't have any money to do so other than like a pound to buy i don't know five cigarettes like you, you could buy individual cigarettes and things so i was doing that and then just um camped out in an alleyway somewhere with a couple of rucksacks around me sacrificing food for cigarettes do you well <laughs> something like that yeah i think it seemed a wise idea when you're a teenager yeah yeah of course um and so that was uh kilimanjaro and so you'd done three before three self-funded before you started uh looking at the big ones um yeah those three were self-funded so again just through a variety of jobs and i basically just didn't have a social life or anything um and then went to university, slightly let loose for a bit, as you should at university. And then I had this weird uh, transition around Christmas time where I watched a, f- a TV program and somebody climbed a big mountain in the pool. And I thought, Jesus, Jordy, get get your ass back in gear. And I immediately then paid the deposit for Denali for the following July. Um, so what, six, seven months uh, after that and then again slightly went from student let's get pissed and make a fool out of yourself mode to get into expedition mode again so you know this was this weird thing at university where I would try and socialize and do the normal thing and would but then I'd also be dragging people up and down and tires up and down the, the beach in order to train for a sled pulling expedition in Denali and then I'd be running however many times a week and you know, it was and um, working incredibly hard to try and get the money. So it was this weird um, divide between sort of normal student life and then what I was trying to do on the side. Um, and then Denali was, yeah, July 20, ooh, no, 2009, um, which was, again, a wonderful expedition, um, just a lot of fun, just a fun trip. I think the others were more demanding. Um, in terms of what I was trying to do, whereas that one I felt pretty confident about my own physical ability and I was more mature. I was probably in a better mental headspace and I was just, we had a lot of laughs um, in a very remote place with quite a cohesive 12-person team and you're self-sufficient, you've got your sleds, you're digging in your tents and you're living out of your sleds and there's something sort of self-sustainable about that which was enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so once you, because I know that your first attempt of Everest was an interesting one. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so post Denali, I then, I then decided on Everest and, um, again, paid the deposit, which was, as is often the case, a really good, you know, way to commit to something. If you paid I don't know, a thousand pound deposit, um, then it sort of just goes, okay, this is a this is a line in the sand and this is your deadline and you can work towards that. And then I just spent many, many months and hundreds of emails and letters and phone calls uh, to try and get a sponsorship, which was um, just a really demoralizing process. I learned an enormous about, amount and I look back now and I'm slightly cringing about how I did it, or mainly in terms of my own naivety, I'd say rather than my methods it was just we had no idea what we were doing i had a friend who was helping me a lot um but eventually we got there just i think through sheer perseverance really um and then ended up on everest and i was 20 and i had done big expeditions but not really big expeditions not so two-month expeditions which is what everest was i think i found that uh quite hard i was still young i think mentally still quite young um anyway we then fast forward the climb was going okay i wasn't super strong but i was competent i was confident as well in my own ability to summit and then i got a really bad throat infection at base camp before a summit attempt 
Um, so I was struggling to breathe, had a really bad voice. Anyway, we got to high camp. Um, I was struggling to eat much at this point. Uh, I'd had a half pack of jelly babies or something, but pretty much not much for a couple of days and was, was pretty ill in terms of my breathing and had taken a bit of time set off for the summit. And then it was, as you say, interesting. Um, and it's one of those where you go, it was sort of a perfect, um, not literally the weather was perfect, which is one of those ironies, but it was a perfect storm in terms of situations uh, that all emerged at the same time. So, you know, first of all, my, my head torch cut out, um, batteries weren't happy with the cold, spare batteries didn't work. So I was sort of fumbling around in the dark and free climbing up without a rope and, you know, things like that and relying on moonlight, which again, it seemed fine at the time, you know, just plowing on. But actually on the north face of Everest, that's that's a pretty rash thing to do when you can't see properly. And then I had three incidents really back to back. One was uh, a teammate, well, the sh- Sherpa at the bottom of the uh, first step got incredibly altitude sick. He had summited twice before, but very altitude sick and was throwing photos of his family off the mountain um, saying he was going to die and it required... And he didn't. Re- he didn't want the oxygen we gave him. Um, he refused it because he wanted to, you know, die in peace. Um, which was <laughs> there's not much we could do about it. And it required another shepherd to come behind him and, and literally punch him in the face. Um, you know, full, full sort of Mike Tyson style, and floor him, and then wake him up and say, "Right, you're coming down on me." So uh, Keith and I carried on going. Keith then. Uh, he, he sort of asked me whether it was cloudy outside and whether we should descend. It was perfect blue skies. So his eyesight had frozen over, his corneas had started to freeze, so he descended. I then fast forwarded, came across uh, another teammate at the base of the second step who was incredibly altitude sick, um, blocking the route, and he couldn't really remember who he was, where he was, what his name was how to put on his rucksack. So we had to put that on for him. So yeah, just chaos really. And then got to the top of the second step and came across another teammate who had run out of oxygen. Um, uh, and so gave him one of mine and spoke with him for a bit until someone else could take him down and then carried on going and then got to the stage where I had to turn around. Um, I saw a, a teammate descending, spoke to him and basically realised that I didn't have time in my view to safely summit and come back down again um so i was probably 150 meters from the top um which is about two and a half hours um which is not very far but i I think i I was very tired certainly but i basically concluded that i couldn't I, i still think i would have summited i think i would have just blindly and blinkered in my perspective, would have continued on going and summited. I just was by myself and I was now 21 years old. And I'm pretty confident I would have had a proper drama on the way down. So I turned around and then, yeah, had an epic descent and lived to tell the tale, but didn't didn't have the summit photo I wanted. Yeah, because I imagine I, I it's a difficult one when you have put so much time and effort into you know training for these huge expeditions and finance as well and then to be 150 meters away and sort of feel like it's not your fault I mean when you came back did you feel was there a feeling of giving up or did it just sort of make you slightly more determined I think to be honest I was a bit melancholic when I got back I just um I'd lost a lot of weight I was physically pretty drained mentally pretty drained I mean a a very very intense experience um you know to have and one of the guys who I saw the one who was talking to his rucksack ended up just off the route um just off the route and was lucky to survive my other teammate who I descended with fell in a crevasse I had seen you know, several bodies on the route. And, you know, I was very young and it's, it was, a, I think, quite a lot um, to take on board, actually. And within a week of that day, I was, you know, back at Heathrow Airport. And I, I think that was a, an odd transition. And I think I spent a lot of time trying to come to terms with what had happened, really. 
I don't mean the actual events themselves and what I'd seen and done, but partly that. It was partly the amount of energy, as you said, and effort that I'd expended to trying to get to that stage. And then you have to basically realize that what I did was the right thing to do. And that's a big transition. And I spoke to a lot of teammates about uh, our own experiences on the whole expedition, why other people hadn't summited and specifically why I didn't summit. And, you know, sometimes when you're young and gung-ho and macho, you just think you can sort of rule the world and every and the puzzle pieces all go into place and all will be well. And I think I struggled with that transition when it sort of didn't go according to the plan I'd set myself. But I think that's when I sort of required friends and uh, the wisdom of people older than me to to give me insights, basically, as to whether I'd made the right choice. And I found immense reassurance in that to basically then accept the fact that in reality, I'd done the right thing. In hindsight, if I was in the same position again, I would have made the same decision and it was the right thing to do in terms of my own safety, really. So, you know, again, what, I think back now and I go, you know, as a 20 year old kid, there's, there's bodies on that mountain who basically have exactly the same dilemma and don't do the same thing. And even the following day, there was a guy who I knew at base camp who almost had exactly the same dilemma I had almost to the letter. And he carried on going, summited, died on the way down when his eyes, he got, um, cerebral edema the following year when I summited there was another story of a guy who summited late died on the way down with bad eyesight and cerebral edema there's a body I passed of a young Canadian climber who tried to do it without oxygen summited died on the way down because he summited too late got cerebral edema and I think when you suddenly have context of all of these you go I'm grateful I turned around and didn't become a statistic yeah, I I mean, God, I mean, there's such a, I don't know what it is about that mountain, but as you say, it's that sort of dilemma between the financial commitment and the sort of pressure that you put on yourself to summit and by not doing it, I mean, to have the courage to turn around and say no, especially at that age is, you know, unbelievable. And of course, yeah, a really difficult decision at the time but definitely looking back, the right one. And yeah, as you say, you could have so easily just been another statistic and another body being carried off the mountain. Yeah, you, yeah. I mean, you're right. It's um, There is fortune in that regard. And I think there's, that, that mountain's a funny one. It's, you know, I'm sure we will uh, get onto that when we talk about 2011, but I, this isn't meant to be a, back in my day because it was only 10 years ago thing but if I think of I spoke to my teammates about this after those pictures about Everest last year and the year before came out and I I couldn't relate to them at all I, I couldn't make sense of it because I spent four months at least on that mountain going up and down it on both attempts and was never in a queue and was never in a line of people even when i summited i spent an over an hour on the top with virtually no one around except for my teammates certainly when i had that big issue in 2010 it's because there was no one else around it wasn't because there was a queue of people holding me up so i then see a, you know and i remember in 2011 when i set off for the summit i was completely by myself and i went off without a sherpa and just headed into the dark because I was like, cool, I want to go to the summit now and off we go. And I then look at those photos and I go, that's not, it doesn't, I can't relate to it. Um, but I think there is still something about that mountain, which as you say, seems to just drive people in a different way. I think because the financial element is more significant and more importantly than that, the ego is is far more significant as well. You know, you're going, it's Everest. It's not, it's not an unknown mountain. So then the ego and the risk and the expectation is that much higher. And indeed the mindset of the people that do it is probably different to that of an unknown mountain. You know, it's not, it's because it's 
is because it's Everest, it attracts a certain type of person who is probably of the mindset that they are willing to do that. I think a lot of people now see Everest because so many people seem to do it and the people see those pictures, there's a sort of feeling of, oh, anyone can do it. Or do you think it's very, now after seeing those pictures, more and more people will be sort of put off? I think amongst real climbers, proper climbers, um, who have been doing it their life, they've always had this torn relationship with Everest. I had a guide, for example, on my sef- second trip, who for 20 years had been chatting away, saying he would never climb Everest because it's a cliche thing, it's commercialised and anyone can do it. And yet he was given the opportunity to climb there and he goes, sure, I'll do that. I think a lot of people would love the opportunity and would still try and grasp that with both hands and often might underestimate it as well. However, as for those pictures, I think it's still a really difficult achievement and still worthy of credit. I think this is the idealistic scenario is that you almost have an asterisk next to it about how you did it. Um, You know, and I I spoke to one of my very... um, wise teammates actually before and after our expedition he was with me in 2010 and he was like look there's a spectrum here bang of how you want to do everest and on this side is solo unsupported this is your weinhold messners these are your galinda carlton bruners who are going solo without oxygen and just bang smashing it and they're heroes they're yuli schlecks and on the other side you have people who have unlimited oxygen, who have unlimited Sherpas, who have an unlimited budget, who get a helicopter back to Kathmandu from base camp, who a short rope down and up the mountain. And that's fine. But what annoys me, and it annoys me in adventure in general, if I'm being cynical, is I don't see why people need to lie about how they've done things or indeed lie about having done things. Because it's a lot easier to just do it properly and do it the way you're most comfortable with. And then, hey, presto, you don't need to lie about it. Um, I think some Everest will always remain appealing to certain characters. I remember a friend saying to me, I think everyone at some point or another, within reason, um, has probably dreamt of climbing Everest. And I don't, you know, of what it's like anyway. And I don't think that desire will disappear because a couple of photos of a queue near the top i think the desire will still be there the parameters for difficulty will be minimized because that's what modern technology does and i think that's fine if you really want to challenge yourself and masochistically put yourself in a tough position on the side of a mountain there's other ones you can do it on if you want you can still climb everest and people will still want to do that i i think as you say it's that um it's that feeling of the biggest mountain into the world or the biggest mountain in the world you've climbed and you can sort of have that on your CV. I think a lot of people like that sort of feeling, that feeling of conquering the biggest mountain. Yeah, the biggest, hardest, fastest, whatever, toughest, it's longest. You know, look at any look at any subtitle on a book. It's, you know, that's all everyone. It's the same. It's trying to get sponsorship as well. You know, it's hard to get sponsorship if you're like, I'm a young guy or young girl who wants to climb Everest. It's like, hey, presto, join the club. It's, you know, which, which is the catch-22 of trying to get sponsorship. You then need to become and do something in order to get the money for it. I couldn't have got the funding, I don't think, unless I was going to become the youngest because there's no media angle. You're not going to get a TV program and a, a big marketing deal if you're not going to get media exposure. So then this catch-22, and that goes back to what we were talking about earlier. It's really nice going on a trip with my cycle, for example, when there's no desire for media, when there's no need for sponsorship, because you can just go and you don't need to say, I'm the youngest, fastest, whatever. You can just do a trip because you want to do a trip. I think back in 2012, when I was trying to get sponsorship for my cycle across the States, at the time, I thought it was quite a big thing to do and I remember going I think to a bike shop to see if the bike shop would give me a sponsorship and I remember his just expression was just like oh 
God. Another one. Another one. And I thought it was a really big deal. I was like, you know, and he was like, well, you know, if you do it on a uni cycle, then I might. Yeah. And I was like, God. That's been done. Yeah, I know. And it, anyway, when I did, I did see a uni cyclist going from Canada down to the tip of the Cape of Horn. Uh, yeah, yes, Cape right, Horn. Yeah. So, yeah, a lot of these things, a lot of these big adventures, especially in the last, I think, 10, 20 years, are slowly becoming harder and harder to get a sort of big media angle. And as you say, any company who's willing to sponsor you is going to need a media angle. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's quite a difficult one to get sponsorship, I would say, for anyone who is trying to go out there and do some crazy adventure is probably... Unle- yeah, yeah I, I, I agree. I think it is. However, 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 there are... It depends on your competency and what you're doing. You know, like... It, and how you want to record it. There's so many amazing expeditions that are still happening from people who are genuinely pushing boundaries, doing really bold, exciting stuff, still getting sponsored for it because they're not doing the same as everyone else. Yeah, yeah. I, I think th- on my last podcast, we spoke about Ross Ed- Edgley, who had just swam around Great Britain, which is just nuts. And, you know, as you say, if you can think it, then you can probably do it. Yeah, to to a large degree, there's I think there's a, certainly a degree of um, creativity that people would need if they want to do something. Um, or, but again, it comes down to what trips you want to do. My cycle was and is, as you know, one of the cheapest means of transport, and I think it's one of the most demanding and fulfilling ones. So it comes down to what you want to do and i certainly i was just writing about this or going through the edits and one of the things i was saying was just be honest with yourself about the type of trip you want to go on and don't try and fulfill someone else's aspirations or expectations you know if you if you want to go cycle touring then if you want to do 50 miles a day do 50 miles a day if you want to do 150 do it i don't i don't care and it doesn't actually matter um because Mark Beaumont will be faster than you. And that's great. So you're not trying to beat Mark Beaumont. And if you are going to beat Mark Beaumont, then go for it. It's if you if you full credit if you can. But um, you know, so if you say you can do 150 miles, it's great. But he can do 250. So who cares? You're trying to you know you you're trying to do it for your own reasons. And I I still think this is someone was asking. I did an interview recently and they were asking about advice and I was like, just be honest with why you're going on this trip. Like it's the hardest thing to get your head around. But I think as soon as you can get that right in your own head about why you're doing it, then it makes everything a lot easier. You know, and you also don't need to tell anyone. You don't need to tell the world oh, I'm doing it to satisfy my ego, or give myself a CV boost or because I'm trying to prove a point or get over a mental health issue, like whatever it is. Get it right in your own head, and then you'll have the freedom to make the decisions you want. I uh, yeah. I again. I remember the first time I broke a hundred miles in a day. I was really really chuffed. But again, no one cares. No one cares. <laughs> but it's still great. <laughs> it's a good little thing for yourself. But yeah, yeah I remember. For you, yeah. And you know, because I was sort of hitting seventy, eighty, and you know, as you do it, you're energy levels build up and you can go further and further each day and then when i broke 100 miles i was like yes thank god i think it was like on 19 day 19 and i was like sweet okay but yeah as you say no one really cares yeah, and then you're like and then you're like well done me yeah but it's no one cares but you care and sometimes that's enough <laughs> and then after that you know so many times there were so many opportunities where i could have stopped I, in America, I remember stopping at a cafe and this woman and uh, her husband were f- started chatting to me because, you know, I, I have a British accent and I was wearing Lycra in the middle of the Midwest in the middle of this really... Where are we talking? Where in the Midwest? I think we're talking like Ohio or Indiana. Oh, yeah, good. Pro- pro- proper Midwest, that. Yeah. yeah. And 
I remember at the time she was like, oh, you know, if you, oh, actually, I really apologize for my American accent. <laughs> I won't even, att- I won't even attempt it. But uh, she was saying, if you would like to come and watch my kids recital tonight, you know, we're very happy for you to come along. Yeah. And I remember at the time thinking, mm, nah, I'm, I'm all right. But actually looking back, I wish In I had gone. Time. Yeah. And that's the thing is all these small interactions you have along the way are actually what makes the day and everything about your trip more interesting. It's not cycling. Cycling is just a means to get from A to B. And it's a very nice way of transporting yourself around the world. But it's the interactions with the locals, which will be the lasting memories you have, I always find. Did you find that? Yeah, to a large extent, I did. I, you know, the um, I've I split the the trip pretty much in two, and I I was, I've written well, I've actually written the book on just um just the first half of the trip, but it's because there was a different mindset and also understanding um the the reason real reasons for the trip, but it's still what was your mindset for it? For which bit? Uh, your first part, you said you had two different mindsets. The first part? Uh, so the first part was London, Singapore, so Europe and Asia. I think the um, it's different because that was about leaving, consciously leaving home um, and making the decision to not fulfill the expectations that was sort of placed upon you as a, you know, relatively... Uh, mature person who's left a job and you know what you should be doing at a particular stage of your life um so i think that was an important phase to go through and then it was about understanding what cycle travel was like you know to be alone you know that, that, that i've called the this isn't meant to be a self-promotion thing i've called the book a rolling stone because i'm a huge bob dylan fan and there's you know i don't even know the song but it's like how how does it feel to be on your own without a home like as, as a rolling stone? And it's, um, it's that principle was that always, it's the same thing. It's like, I just wanted to understand what solo travel was like. You know, I'd read so many bloody books about, you know, Paddy Lee Firma this, Wilfred Thesiger that, Rory Stewart this, you know, they've all done these great things and they're always by themselves. And I just did not have any understanding of what that was really like and i've done some cool expeditions over the years but i still was like what about these solo ventures what is it about them and what is it about deserts and i was sort of fascinated by these two things so i just wanted to go off exploring and understand what bike travel was like and you know i'd read friends books about them in the weird countries with weird people and in interacting with people in a way and somehow surviving i was like how did they survive how did they get food and water and phone signal and communicate with people how do you communicate with someone in the middle of china when you don't speak the language like all of these questions i just still could not get my head around it just seemed a very very authentic way of traveling and i was sort of obsessed by this idea of authenticity so that's why that's why I sort of wanted to go on it and probably a bit of escapism about not wanting to be bracketed about what I should be doing. But um, I think the other bit of that phase of the trip was like real sort of like proof to yourself, you know, go through Siberia and winter type stuff. I think there was a bit of, okay, if we're going to do this cycling thing, then make it really, really hard. And then, then you can understand the cycling thing. Once you've seen the extreme, you can then wind yourself back in. And I pushed it about as far as I think I could have, actually. I really don't think I actually could have survived mentally as much as physically much more than I did by myself. And then that took me then to Singapore and your, I slightly recalibrated my mind. I The back end of Southeast Asia, I, I sort of realized why why I'd gone on a trip and what I was lacking. And I saw four or five friends in Southeast Asia who were living out there. And I was like, what am I doing by myself? Um, I don't, I basically, as as wonderful as it is to be by yourself in a foreign country, I just, I felt a much closer affinity to my own home when I was 10,000 miles away. 
so that's why it changed. And then you reasonably might ask, well, why do you continue across Australia, New Zealand and America? It's because I sort of, the mindset was different. Like that second half was, okay, admittedly still 10,000 miles, but it was, it was fun. I, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the encounters. I had a lot of banter and humor with a lot of people. I embraced every detour and you know i still rode really long miles and pretty quick but i loved meeting different people and laughing with people in the midwest people in the middle of an australian desert watching the cricket with kiwis whatever the hell it was they were just i really missed that sort of human interaction yeah yeah i think so in terms of, in terms of your questions about individuals like it really mattered also the language barrier i always find quite difficult um in russia especially when you're up in siberia did you struggle um i struggled a lot more in china to be honest um i found i found china very very mentally draining um kazakhstan was funny i found it funny other than winter winter was was a challenge but i still think the people because i was by myself in a desert they have a very, very strong nomadic culture in Kazakhstan. So I was constantly and consistently stopped by locals, giving me a completely extraordinary variety of things and money and water and random apple juices and sausages and just like random pizza and things like that, just like random things. And everyone was kind and happy to see me and smiled and wanted a selfie all the time. And I specifically say selfie because this is the difference I had with China. And I then went to China, went through Xinjiang for a month, which was, I think, a pretty much close to the worst month of I can remember in my life. And and then the rest of China was beautiful, inspiring, impressive, um, fascinating all the time, but very, very stressful. Um, there was no time to relax or stop or process. There was no sort of time off. I would stop at every restaurant I'd go to just to get, I don't know, a bowl of noodles or something. And I just felt like, I just said in the book, I was like a fish in a fishbowl. Um, I felt like a zoo animal, you know, with um, a lot of people looking at you constantly and walking up and not taking a selfie, just walking up and taking a photo um of my face from about a meter away um and it happened you know and it's funny uh, and it is funny talking about it now i'd be sat in a restaurant and i would have cues if not no not cues or crowds of people walk up to me not asking not asking for a selfie or having one with you just walking up and going bang photo in your face and laughing and walking away and <laughs> it's funny <laughs> other than when it, other than when it happens it's so annoying though ev- well other than when it happens every single day every single rest stop for months and i couldn't communicate with people properly and i just i think wanted someone to laugh with basically and be like this is ridiculous i want a mate alongside me to be like for fuck's sake what are we doing with our lives? And instead, I just had my own thoughts to be like, what am I doing with my life? And I found it quite difficult, actually. I, Because I, a couple of years ago, we were in Tajikistan and all the cyclists come through from China into Tajikistan or Tajikistan into China. And they said China was difficult. I especially um, in certain areas was very, very challenging. You know, I think where you were saying in in one place, you you can't get off the side of the road. You can't actually go into the village without a sort of policeman telling you to get back on the road and don't go. And I, I think it's sort of a very contentious issue at the moment. But back here, was it the same last year? Um, yeah, so that's, that's Xinjiang, which is northwest China. Yeah. Um, which yeah it's it's a really it's a really contentious part of the world it's somewhere i'm really not fond of at all and don't speak about with any fondness pretty much i almost and added to that i feel slightly saddened about my own 
bitterness and antipathy towards aspects of China because it was an amazing country in many ways. But Xinjiang, I, I'm very happy to criticise because I think it's pretty awful, to be quite honest. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I, for, for, from a personal point of view, I was held by police every single day, about four or five times a day for a month. Uh, I was camping under motorway bridges because they can't let you camp outside of the barbed wire from the motorways. It was just rubbish. The police would confiscate my phone, delete photos from my phone arbitrarily, not just from Xinjiang, but like arbitrarily delete photos. Um, you'd have facial recognition, fingerprint scanners every 20 kilometers. It was really bad and just constantly interviewed or forced to stay in hotels. And I slightly knew what I was getting myself in for. I was anticipating it to an extent, but I think experiencing that and being the wrong side of that is very, very different to reading about it in advance. And I became quite resentful about the situation. I, I also think that regardless of my own experiences, and this has gone down a slightly more cynical line of interviewing now, but regardless of my own experiences, I um, I do think that imprisoning over a million people because of their religious beliefs is quite hard to justify. Yeah. And you've got the book about this trip coming out. Um, actually, probably by the time this podcast goes live, it will be available to buy. It will be available at uh, very few bookshops, but it's definitely available on Amazon. Um, well, I'll, I'll I'll put the link below so people can buy it if uh, after listening to this podcast. That's very kind. Um, no, hey, I I actually don't think the um, I don't feel the trip was finished until I'd been able to write about it. Um, in all honesty, I almost felt the same with the Seven Summits, although it took me ten years to write that. I just feel it's the most important way to reflect and condense one's thoughts. I, th I think, I, th I think they're always interesting because to me, I find when I put them out, it's not interesting to me, but I'm always interested in other people's adventures and seeing what they did and how they did it differently. So for one, per, for, you know, one, it's not that interesting, but I think to others, it can be very interesting. Well, so I've, a couple of very good friends are uh, fellow adventurous folk and cyclists and things like that. And um, I was lucky to get some very good uh, of people I respected endorsements for the book, but also others who I've read their books about this trip. And I think they are interested in how I basically portray the story because you know, they've gone on not dissimilar adventures, but have written about it in a very different way to what I would. Brilliant writers, but they would just focus on different things. So as I would, I focus on the human interactions, and those are the two most important things, really, were writing about the human interactions and the funny, interesting experiences. And that's the sort of travelogue aspect of this is, you know, if you read it, I want a reader to understand something more about a part of the world that I went through that I certainly had no idea about. And, and I want them to learn in that regard, because that's what I would want to know. And there's also the um, introspective, reflective side of it, of why one goes on these trips about solo travel, what it means to be by yourself. Um, which again, I know other people that wouldn't give a hoot about when they write, but they would be very, very good at describing the exact cultural significances of a particular incident, which I do to an extent, but I can't write in that way as much, whereas I find it easier to understand the the whys and the hows and, and that sort of aspect. So, you know, I, that's why I, I like reading friends books who've done trips because I'm like, okay, I want to get in your head and what have you prioritised about your trip, which someone else might not. Who, who were they? Uh, well, I mean... Well, in terms of endorsements, yeah. Uh, well, Robin Henry Tennyson was one who's a, a great adventure over the years. Um, Randolph finds Mark Beaumont did, which was great. Um, Erling Cargo, who's one of my favourite writers, 
Um, you know, so there's been, there's a few, uh, Chrissy Wellington did, but that's totally different. She's an Ironman athlete, but I think she's one of the coolest people in history. So there's, there's a great selection and it's, it's very humbling, but, um, I'd say it's more about, I wanted to write a book that, that in an adventure world that people would look at and be like, okay, that's something different. That's interesting. And it provides a perspective that other people might not have done, um, which is, I guess, all you can really hope for. Oh, well, go check out A Rolling Stone on Amazon. Is that on Amazon? <laughs> yeah, it will be on Amazon. You're very kind. <laughs> Are you going to write a book at some point, John? No, I say so I've actually started uh doing a photo oh, book. you're doing a podcast i'm doing a podcast so i find it more interesting you are a very very good photographer to be fair oh well thank you uh so i my plan is to do a photograph book of the white silk road as we called it um which was attempting to ski all the way to central asia and afghanistan but uh it turned into something a bit different in the end which um not skiing and just sort of immersing yourself into this insane adventure really of because have you ever been to Tajikistan and no I didn't in the end I mean places like that and Kyrgyzstan are sort of so wild and so I don't know how to describe it um it's just an adventure's paradise it's just so isolated as you say there's no phone signal you're very much left to your own accord and then mixing that in with sort of Uzbekistan and Iran and Turkmenistan and so it was a really interesting trip but uh, I sort of did you, did you have a guide in Iran because you timed that very well to what, to go before now basically well <laughs> we were on the border about to cross into Iran. We were in Turkey at the border when Trump announced the end to the Iranian deal. And so we were going through Iran as Boris Johnson was foreign secretary at the time. We were being like, oh my God, what is he going to say? What is he going to say? Um, luckily, he said, you know, we, we approve of the Iranian deal. So I was like, okay, I think we're safe being Brits now. But I... We, how do we say, we managed to get a way that we were guided without having a guide. I probably, I probably can't put this on the podcast, but basically, no, I mean, that's, that's how a lot of people do it. it we, ha- we claimed to have a guide and we paid a guide, but he never turned up. Yeah, perfect. And so, and that actually made all the difference because... On our trip, a lot of it was how do we find the most isolated place in the middle of nowhere that we can camp, where we can sort of just enjoy. And I think if you had someone there who'd be like, no, no, you're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do that. You have to go and stay in this hotel, which is heavily overpriced. I think at that point, you'd just be like, oh, this is just shit. So... uh, and that's the thing with this trip is it's very difficult to come up with an angle of how, of what it was really, I think anyway. It's very difficult to, because it's two guys who went out to go and ski in every country from Switzerland to Afghanistan and to sort of try and break down these ideas of what people had to Afghanistan and Iran, which were usually very portrayed very negatively in the media. And actually, Iran was an incredible place. And, you know, we managed to go skiing in one of them, in one of the resorts and ski toured for seven hours to ski down for two minutes, which was great fun. Um, As you say, climbing up mountains to ski in some of the worst snow I've ever experienced. But we went so late, so it was no surprise. But as you say, it's, uh, you have to have a sort of reason and an angle and at the moment, I don't really have that to sort of tell to tell a good story. And as soon as I find it, then I can tell the sort of story. But I guess it also depends what your aims are for what you produce. Yeah, because I, as I say, I, I, I attempted to what's the word vlog 
while I was doing it and sort of try and tell the story to a camera rather than my camera phone. And I realized sometimes I, I don't come across as very, I'm, I'm usually a really quite happy person and quite smiley, but as soon as a camera gets in front of my face, my face goes, and I, very sincere, yeah. Yeah, I suddenly become super serious and everything's, everyone's like, my God, you look so grumpy. Why are you, look, why are you so miserable? <laughs> You're like, no, I was really happy. It was the, the greatest thing. <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of the tough balance, isn't it? That's the problem with TV stuff. That's why the really good presenters manage to somehow do it instantaneously yeah. and authentically, which is not easy. This is the part of the show where we ask the same five questions to everyone each week. And the first one is, on your trips, what's the one bizarre thing that you crave or miss? Ice cream and really good coffee. Proper, strong, good coffee, yeah. Good coffee. Okay. I I actually gave up on instant coffee on my cycle. It demoralized me. I was like, unless it's good stuff, it just makes me more unhappy, I think. Did you not uh, on your trips have the sort of, you know, grounded coffees, you know, extra luggage on, on the cycle trip? That- I I had other extra luggage i actually didn't on that one but i always had herbal tea that was Uh, every night i would sit outside with a cup of tea and i was always happy yeah i have to say that's that's one of the guilty pleasures i always find as well um what is your favorite adventure book uh what were the ones i mean Bear Grylls, the first one. It's not my favorite adventure book. It was. It certainly got me started. I think John Krakow is a great adventure writer. I wrote. I reread um, uh, Into the Wild actually a few months ago, which was really enjoyable. You know, I haven't read it for ten years. Uh, I reread Rory Stewart, but placed in between. Um, when I got back from the cycle, loved that. I mean, if I. <laughs> I I, I, if I can count things like Lord of the Rings and Peter Pan as adventure books, I would put them in my high adventure category. Yeah, uh, I think Lord uh, of the Rings is a great adventure. Yeah, that, I think uh, a lot of inspiration from Lord of the Rings, especially New Zealand. I mean, that really. Yeah, agreed. When you when you go out there, it's just unbelievable, really. I think Frodo and Bilbo had a proper adventurous spirit to be fair yeah i i would say as adventures go they probably had a pretty epic one as well <laughs> um did you have an inspirational figure growing up was there someone you looked up to um i mean my parents are probably the biggest factors in my outlook on life um so i think probably like all children i looked up to them I, certainly as a boy i would look up to my dad an enormous amount i think they certainly shaped my view on the world and gave me the freedom to pursue these adventures so you know they they would be up there i think uh, in terms of people i didn't know i think the shackletons mallory's nelson you know i think those those three were sort of always present in some way who all all three of them had a sort of disregard for what convention was and they just sort of persevered and led their men very well. Let's see if one of those are in your next question. Uh, Favourite quote? They did have some great quotes. Shackleton, uh, he always, yeah, he always put his men first, Shackleton, to be fair, which I liked. What do you say is better to be a... Uh, a dead, a dead li- live, a dead, uh, a dead, uh, live, live donkey uh, yeah. and a dead lion. I, I, I would go with that, but I actually know favorite quotes. I always, so I always had um, a book of quotes with me on expeditions. There was a couple that always stood out. It was things like Jim Bridwell saying, Doubt is the enemy of success, was a small one. There was another nice one which I always liked about the battle between um, a stream 
and a rock and the stream always wins through sheer, through perseverance rather than sheer strength i always like that that idea um and actually i've got what is it the one on um on my website it's it's an ian fleming quote it says always well, never say no to adventure otherwise you'll live a very dull life or well, along those lines and i think those are nice i also i always had um rudyard kipling's if i always on every diary i've ever written it's pretty much the first thing i write the if poem my i think my dad forced my brothers and sisters uh to learn that when they were about five and six <laughs> probably no bad thing no um, a lot of people listening are always keen to go on these grand adventures. What's the one thing you would recommend to get them started? Uh, it's, it's not even an advice question, is it? I recommend. I always see the idealistic side of me says, you know, follow your passions, follow your hearts, because that's the right thing to do. Which is to an extent true. I. I sort of would always encourage people to just have the confidence to pursue what they think is the right plan and not follow convention about what people say they should be doing. I think that's really important. And I, I think that was the most important decisions I've made have probably been when I've personally done it or whether I've been encouraged to pursue an instinctive idea I had that was outside of the norm and i think that's been the most fulfilling parts i've ever taken okay and i suppose everyone is wondering after covid what is next i don't what is this world john i don't know what this world is post covid uh i don't know i um i never know i had no plans to do my cycle trip until about six months or a year before it and i at the moment i'm have very very little spare time to finish the book i have that's coming out in a month i will write another one after that about a totally different subject and i will I, at the moment i'm pretty happy where i am i don't feel any great need to go on any big trips but i have no idea what will happen in the future i think if you had, if you had asked me a year ago when i got back what are you going to do i don't think we expected to be in lockdown for six months so i sort of felt content to sort of be in the uk for a bit of time because usually I'm, yeah, I'm the same i i love this country very much i missed it when i was away and right now i'm very happy in my own little uk bubble do you always appreciate it when you come back yeah well there's that um driving on the I left Cups of tea. Well, I quoted it at the end of the book, so like you know, you only know when you travel when you come home to your old, your old pillow. And there's a bit of that. There's something reassuring about coming back to the UK, certainly. But that's why it was nice to be in something like New Zealand or Australia. There's there's elements of of the UK, and you go, okay, cool. There's a bit of home here, which is nice. Um, but yeah, no, I just I quite happy getting back and laughing at British banter and Ricky Gervais being an idiot and I quite miss that to be honest and watching the cricket <laughs> and the Premier League uh, on um, on our travels <laughs> I remember when the Football World Cup was on I used to watch it in the most bizarre places I think in on a ship in the Caspian Sea and like everyone else was sort of doing their thing but I don't know sport I, I really miss when I travel so do I. So I, yeah, and like you, I always find a weird and wonderful way of watching it. But yeah, yeah I don't know. I think I think the um, that whole cycle and to an extent lockdown as well. But it's all part of the same narrative, which is um, which is slightly about perspective and reprioritizing. And I think my priorities are different now to what they were two years ago, which is probably a stage of life thing. It's probably a satiated from travel and being abroad and yeah. Yeah. Well, Jordy, thank you so much for coming on the show. Go check out his book, A Rolling Stone. And thank you again. It's been an absolute pleasure. Lovely to chat. Thank you. Slept on the floor in the bathroom and literally woke up in the next morning, pulled myself up onto the sink, looked at myself in the mirror and thought, this is not healthy. This is, this is not the direction your life should be going. 
and I kind of went up to my desk and looked around and went, I don't want to be these people. I don't want to be the guy who doesn't see his wife and kids. I don't want to be the person who never ends up with someone. I don't want to, my life to be just stuck in this office for another 30 years.